Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hub24 is an ASX-listed company with over $15 billion funds under management and one of the fastest-growing platforms in the market. Neither a bank nor part of a bank, Hub24 focuses entirely on connecting advisors to a broad range of investment solutions for their clients. Discover why other advisors think Hub24 are the best in the market and access the benefits of choice and efficiency for you and your clients with their market-leaning managed portfolio solution. To find out more, visit hub24.com.au. G'day, g'day. How's it going? What do you know? Strike a light. Dylan Martin here, um, mate of mine, uh, met through XY actually, and we we're hanging out the other day. And I said, actually, we need to um, we need to go back to the podcast from two and a half, three years ago, and do an update. So this is what today is about. Um, obviously you um, took over a business that you'd been working in for a while and, yep. uh, and you know, you've been making that work for you down in bustling Wollongong. Love the gong. Uh, love the gong, which, we, um, which I think, I'm pretty sure we're actually taking the XY tour to, for the mid-year tour events. So, very exciting. Yeah, very exciting. Um, mate, so for those of you out there that don't know Dylan, mate, give us like a 30 second rundown. 30 second rundown. All right. Well, first of all, there's always a method to my madness. That's the first <laughs> thing you need to know. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Look, born and bred South Australian, uh, spent the first 17 years of my life in Adelaide, uh, moved over to uh, Sydney or New South Wales in 2007 after I finished year 12. Uh, to be with my now ex-wife. We had 14 years together, three kids, uh, settled down in Wollongong uh, for 12 years now, finished university in Wollongong back in 2010. And I've had the business, or been working in the business for nine years. I've been a part owner for seven and a full owner for nearly nearly 18 months, probably eight, over 18 months, September 2000, August 18, I think it was. So, yeah. Yeah. And huge, like huge. And, and one of the coolest things is you hear a lot about these transition plans in mm -hmm. financial advice. You know, you hear a lot about them theoretically and everyone kind of like wants to do them and tries to do them. But you're one of the few people that I've seen actually do it um, successfully. So when, when we, I guess when we spoke about it um, two and a half, three years ago, uh, it was sort of, you were a part owner and you were looking to take over. Uh, that's now occurred yes. in amongst the maelstrom. Now you don't get to use that word very often. Maelstrom of Facia um, and the Royal Commission. So this was all unfolding as you became the sole owner. Yep. Mate, talk us, what, what were you feeling and how did, how did you approach both, uh, all the upheaval and being now solely responsible. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, look, it, it's uh, timing was, was, was funny. You know, it, it was, uh, I knew what I was getting into, you know, purchasing the rest of the business kind of on the eve of the Royal Commission, if you like, before it all sort of un, unpacked and unfolded. Um, the one thing for me, no matter what was to happen in the future was I'd been in the business since December, 2010. And I've been in just about every single client meeting from 2011 onwards. So for me, you know, we talk about acquisitions and buying books. I wasn't buying a book. Uh, I was I was extending my journey in, in the same business, you know. Um, so I knew exactly what I was purchasing, exactly. I knew the clients like the back of my hand. Most of those clients had been seeing me and only me for the last three or four years anyway, um, as the other director was taking a bit of a back, a back seat. Um, so yeah, whilst it, it sounds scary on paper, um, there was no other option in my mind. There was no other option. Yeah. And, and like I said, it's, that is the ideal scenario. Uh, like when I, when I sold, uh, my business, there was another person in, in my dealer group who picked it up, but they didn't know my clients. And that was always 
sort of a difficult thing because my clients had built a relationship with me and then there was sort of a hard landing, so to speak, with a, with a new advisor. So in hindsight, that I don't, I don't, I just don't think that was the best outcome for my clients. I'm sure that the advisor did uh, a great job. Um, it's just, it probably wasn't, it wasn't the smoothest transition for my clients. Um, whereas in your scenario, nothing really changed, right? So, so as far as they were concerned, probably, you know, it probably didn't even change the documentation. That's that's absolutely correct, and I've got to give you know credit to to the, the previous owner and, and uh, my ex business partner because he was very big on you know the clients falling in love with the firm, okay, the yeah. clients falling in love with the firm, not the not the individual advisors or advisor, because as you know, if one goes away or moves on, there's all sorts of potential issues, uh, and not only are they just they really want to follow that one advisor, you've got, yeah, you've got issues there as well. So ha- him having me in all the meetings as a para planner, as an admin, starting off fresh, that was probably the, the best thing that he could have done or we could have done. And um, that's real life practical transition planning out there. Just get him in every single meeting so that they know you just like they know the, the advisor they've been working with for 10 years. Um, so not much really changed. Uh, branding was the same. Documentation was the same. I was, I was probably more stressed and a little bit grayer in the beard, but um, <laughs> uh, but uh, certainly the only thing that changed was the, the office move. I, I, I made a decision to, to move offices, which we can we can get into when you're ready. But that was really the big one, uh, which was a little bit nerve wracking because they're kind of used they they've moved around a little bit in the past uh, this business. So uh, I don't know how they'd take it, but uh, in the end, it it was fine. Yeah. So high level, um, what, percentage, what percentage of the clients that uh, were in the business previous to you becoming the sole owner mm-hmm. stayed on from their point of view by choice? So not including, say, any clients that you had moved on. I'm not sure if that existed or not. Mm-hmm. But what percentage, of, what percentage of clients stayed in the business when you became the sole owner? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, to give you a bit of an idea, at that point, I'm just going to go with engaged clients. Let's forget about um, any any very, very, very tiny amount of legacy or trail grandfather clients where there's little or no contact. Let's go with engaged clients that were uh, signing an ongoing service agreement every year, yeah. whether big or small. Uh, look, at that point, there was probably around yeah, 220, 225 ish active clients or, you know, 150, 160 client groups. I lost about seven to eight clients. Okay. And nearly every single one uh, was either directly related to the previous business owner or a, a really, 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 really close friend uh, or something of that nature. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, that's, that's huge, right? So uh, if anyone out there has ever bought or sold a business, they know that achieving something like, Ninety-seven percent, yeah, exactly, <laughs> is uh, is extraordinary. So, yeah, that's uh, it's definitely a great strategy. Um, in regards to you, as I can mention on that as well. So, this is really important. Um, this is a lesson I kind of learned about business halfway through. Is I, that hurt me a lot because they were engaged clients. They were knowingly happy and with the service and the reviews and, and everything we were doing. And that kind of hurt me a lot until I realized, I think you might've said it as well. I might've even given you a call. I even called on a few X, Y advices like Shane, um, Shane as well. I said, you know, has he said something to him? You know, has he been talking to him? But at the end of the day, you know, they may have just been uh, really enjoying the, the, the family feel and been, been, been hanging around for him. And uh, I decided to uh, put all that aside and just let, let, just let it go and keep pressing forward. So I had to kind of bite my tongue there and, and, and push back the old me and bring in, put on the business hat, the business owner hat and say, well, this, this thing's happened in business. Um, and I quickly moved on, but uh, yeah, it's a bit scary when you lose someone that you actually care about, but yeah. No, hundred percent. Yeah. The, um, one of the things with being an advisor is you really do have to be emotionally intelligent and, mm-hmm. and, and uh, I, I definitely find that the best advisors are good with people and good with numbers. And then but the problem with being good with people is you can almost get a little bit too emotionally attached. Yeah. And, uh, and I love, I just, it doesn't surprise me at all that you achieved sort of 98% and then you were still looking at that 2% going, God damn it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it was one of the many things I love about you, mate. 
Um, so, so what are, I guess, what are you thinking as the Royal Commission unfolds, the FASIA unfolds, you know, costs obviously go up, right? We've seen them in the course of the last 10 years go from probably around $5,000 to open your doors at January 1st. And now it's probably around $50,000. And that's not just licensee fees and it's not just PI. It's all the little registrations and everything you need to do to, to keep your doors open. So what did you try to do? Or actually, I'll, I'll rephrase the question. Yeah. How did you tackle the issue of rising costs, more responsibility, and initially a, a drop down in revenue? Yep, great question. Um, this is something I could probably go on for a very, very long time. So I'll try and keep my responses succinct. So uh, just to answer to you direct question. But first of all, I saw this coming a mile off. And if you were a little bit cluey and a little bit um, forward thinking, which I think uh, the broader XY group is, you could see expenses skyrocketing. You could see the old ways changing. So I saw this a long way off. First thing I did was look at the 35% rent increase the landlord wanted to put on us at our old office and oh. said, just me. And at that point, I had a part-time or two, three days a week. I don't need 86 square metres. And I moved into a, a, a very local, like down the road from our old office, a serviced office, um, much like the WeWorks in Sydney. I think you guys got Regis and WeWork, those sort of things. Yeah. Uh, I made that move, which was a, a humongous um, cost difference. I think I saved nearly 20 grand a year. Um, cut out the cleaning, the, the electricity, the um, multiple billings, all, all that sort of stuff. It's all inclusive. Um, that was the first thing I did. And just tweaking down and becoming more efficient regarding costs. I think one of the main things that I took away was that business coaches and advisors and, and anyone in business often look at how do we increase profits through sales, which is important. Now, don't get me wrong, revenue, sales, income, but no one ever looks at the fat on the on the profit and loss statement, that mm-hmm. what can be down. And I don't mean denying your business or denying yourself the basics. I'm talking about how do, you, how do we do this more efficiently and cut costs to, you know, to basically slowly reduce cost over time. You know, and converting as many clients to email only as you can is, is a perfect, simple example of what we should be doing. So that, that's the one main thing I, I saw before I even bought the business. Awesome. Um, and I've also had a hundred and, you know, like you say, licensee costs have gone up as well. Uh, I've had a 120% increase in our fees, December 1 just gone. Uh, and a lot of that's been absorbed and has already been sort of um, worked through with, with, with what I've done previously. Uh, but it still hurts. It hurts for anyone. Yeah, I mean, 100% increase. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that help? All the unbundling of uh, software subsidies and, you know, you know, licensee subsidies and all the rest of it. So, um, yeah, I do run a very, uh, yeah, very lean business and, and it can be done. It, it, it hit me for a six initially. It was really hard, but it really can be done if you're just really pragmatic and, and, and intelligent about it. Awesome. So I guess you're, on one hand, you're um, running a lean business and you're cutting off the fat, so to speak, to, to, uh, to compensate for the increased costs that, that your company was going to experience. And that's a huge, I mean, I mean, I, I called them um, like the, the monsters in the background eating your money. Yeah. I, think, I think I read that somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and, exactly. And, um, and the whole idea is like doing it, reducing liabilities is so intelligent because you do the work once and then you get long-term benefit from it. So it's not like you, you, you're looking for a deal every week. It's just, you look for the deal once and then you take care of it. And on a business level, that is, huge and I, I fully fully respect that you've gone after that so so i guess uh with the decision rather than just get annoyed at the increase in costs you've done what you can do to offset that and that's a huge man, massively commend you for that and then i know for a while you you spent sort of the first part of your solo journey in betting down uh, the clients and really making sure that you had the end to end solution down pat by yourself uh, before you started taking on new clients. And how long was that sort of season for? Uh, well, if I think, if I think you're talking about what I think you're talking about uh, when I was sort of, isn't that phase where I just want to focus on really bending down the relationships. Um, yeah. Look, there was nothing overly special that, that I did that, any other advisor wouldn't do. But uh, yeah, for, for a good three or four months kind of on and off, I just basically 
really shored up the relationships, even the clients that I was quite strong with, and just basically under promise and over delivered um, to the maximum, went the extra distance and basically opened myself up to them, you know, in terms of, you know, making sure they understood that to me, they're like family. Uh, and I let them in, uh, I let them into a lot of personal parts of my life, uh, which is kind of normal for me because I wear my heart on my sleeve. And, and I think that helped quite a bit. Um, them going, well, he's a real person. He, he's a great advisor. We love him, but he's a real person. Um, you know, he's had a few on and off issues in his personal life that he's, he's, he's progressing through. So that definitely helped up to be vulnerable and just to be completely honest with your clients. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing which was really strange is it mixed into cost cutting as well. I had a major issue with Telstra and re-diversion to phones, this new centre here and multiple phone rentals and all the rest of it. So I said, this is just too much. Scrap the whole thing. I've got my mobile for inbound and outbound. And <laughs> I did that, honestly. And I opened up to a few clients to SMSs and quick replies. They just loved it. Yeah, I've heard, um, I've heard uh, WhatsApp being a really popular client um, conversational tool now because you can upload files and sort of link through to digital signatures and everything. And many people are used to using it. So, um, yeah, that, I mean, yeah, getting rid of a landline. Oh man. Yeah. It's, oh. it's not for everyone because I mean, obviously I'm kind of contactable 24 seven. So you, you can feel a little bit suffocated some days, but realistically, again, this is about running a lean business, uh, you know, trying to maximize profits um, and clients, they get it. They get it. You work from home one day a week, you're in the office a couple of days, you might be on the road one day. They know you can work off this little surface pro. They know you can work off that. They, they, they're not silly. They're, yeah. they're those are human beings who understand that modern business is not 1999 anymore. So, yeah. Um, have you moved any clients on because of all the new rules and regulations? Is that, do you have sort of like a, a cutoff threshold now where it, if you're sort of under this p- place, then it, the risk to reward is just not worth us continuing to work together. Yep, absolutely. This is this is the, this is the painful thing about what's happening in the industry is you've got these clients who they're not special in terms of you know the fee they give you or the, the fulfillment of the work, but they've been with you for 19, 20 years in terms of the firm. Um, I'll take you one step back. I, I did move on a few clients that were just not properly engaging with us, not respecting our offer of reviews and, and even our reviews and, and keeping accountable to the stuff we were doing. Clients I didn't really like were quite rude to me and previous staff. Uh, I moved a few of those on last year, but this year, given the new facility rules and given it's just so expensive. Yeah. Client, it's just so high risk to have an ongoing client. Yeah. I've uh, made the conscious decision to draw the line, like, like I spoke to you about over the break, yeah. and to slim down a little bit. And, and uh, anyone... Anyone in that 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800 dollar mark a year, mostly through farm, um, they've had to move on, and, and some of those clients have been the last you know 20 years before we even did financial planning. Whoa! But um, unfortunately, I, I say I say to them, I explain the changes in the industry, the costs, and the the, the non the the compliance costs, the actual time costs, and I say for me to actually keep you as a, as a client, keep giving the service, I'll have to nearly triple your fee. And that's not going to represent any good financial value for you. Man, that's, uh, that's a huge five, position. Five so far this calendar year. I've got number six to go. Wow. Now, as, as, as brutal as this sounds, a lot of those are post only clients. And it sounds really brutal and, and I miss the clients, but um, I, am, I need to think of my business and myself as well. Oh, yeah. God, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, you're no help to anyone if you, if you, you know, fall afoul of one of the, the many rules and regulations that are, you know, quite, quite intense now, right? Much of a risk. So um, I am slimming down and, and also I've only got nine post clients left. So the rest are all digital only, yeah. fully trained in digital signatures and emails. So uh, that's been a tough decision. Um, but one that every single client has understood when you call them and have that real kind of sensitive, empathetic conversation with them. Yeah. Um, how do you, how are you responding to this? And I mean, there's so many things that are changing and so quickly. I read a really good LinkedIn post the other day. Um, I was by an advisor at Pardon? Yours, was it? <laughs> uh, mate, come on. Um, and the advisor was saying how last year it was all about sort of responding, uh, but next year he's really going to, well, sorry, this year he's really going to focus on 
what he can do um, to, to zig and zag around what's happening, right? So rather than complain, it's like, what do you do to go after the problem, you know? And, um, and that's always such a better mindset. And um, because it, it's like no one, no, one, no one is saying what's happening is, is always the best thing, but always the best thing to do is just to make sure that you're, you're on the right side of what is happening and just staying ahead of the changes, which is really difficult to go through as all the rules and regulations are changing in real time. And I've got, I've got a question that um, I've been talking about with advisors a little bit, just I would say this calendar year. So, um, and that is uh, there's new uh, sort of requirements from <laughs> platforms that you need to have their individual product signed opt-in every year. So now it's like, it's not just an individual business wide one. Um, the trustee needs to also know that what's, what's happening is, is going ahead. How does that make you, does that make you say, okay, well the future now is just fees outside of super. So I'm going to start transitioning now, or do you just go, okay, um, that's just a new part of the process. Uh, I live from column A, I live from column B. Yeah. Um, all our initial advice moving forward, uh, of the last 12 months, I've slowly started to uh, move as much as I can off platform. So I'll do the deposit invoice. I'll do half of it through super, if of course it's super related advice and it's, it's, it's passing all the rules and regulations and I'll invoice the rest as well. Yeah. So I'm training myself for that conversation and training clients. Ongoing, that's a big one. And that's a big one that's going to affect the whole industry. Uh, hand up here, you know, 95% platform. Yeah. Not going to deny it. Uh, do we slowly start moving them off? Um, potentially where the shoe fits. Um, but I feel like uh, we're going to need some help from licensee and, and the likes to start tackling that. Uh, but for now, yeah, I just accept that the products providers want another form done. I'll include it in my review process and just, again, nod my head and smile because the only thing I can do is whatever I do needs to be keeping me going along. I can only do what I can do to keep profits coming in, keep clients happy, number one, yes. and clients people happy. Um, I just nod my head and keep going. In, yeah. in the same way that we all try and block out the noise, sometimes you get emotionally drawn to it and you have a, a big meltdown and you can't realise why we're being targeted, but you just have to block it out and think of all the client conversations where they say, we appreciate your work and we love what you do. Yeah, man. That's a huge thing as well. I don't think that... So infinitely. I, I don't think there's, um, there's no job out there that is as rewarding as a happy financial planning client. Like yeah. to, to, to see the look in their eyes and the thank, the, you know, just the, 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 the thank you that sort of just come from what they're saying to you, what they're writing to you, the way that they're looking at you. It's a really unique position and one that's so rewarding. And you're exactly right. I think for some reason, um, well, actually not for some reason, I do understand that the financial services industry was built off the back of product and you got these large, huge companies that were making a lot of money. And so advisors, we, would, we were just taught that earning uh, revenue via a product was normal. But like the rest of the world doesn't really, like in professional services doesn't really work like that. And it's it's kind of, it's kind of weird. And it's kind of um, uh, like, uh, it's made the conversations a lot easier, but I, I, I've, I've got a suspicion in my mind that the only reason that advisors feel like it made the conversation easier is just simply because that's how it's been done from day one. But if you think of it sort of objectively and go, okay, well, legal profession, accounting profession, medical profession, you know, all these other professions don't receive their revenue via um, third parties. It's just literally client to, to service. And so for example, like we pay our accountant, you know, like substantially more than I ever charged a client when I was an advisor. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and why is that? Like, why, why does he feel so comfortable with putting a large check in front of us? Whereas advisors tend to get a little bit nervous and, and we sort of question, you know, where the value is. And that's, 
crazy. It's it is honestly crazy. It is conditioning from our mentors, conditioning from our previous owners, or from our licensees or our previous uh, conferences or from our previous, uh, you know, um, working bodies. I mean, it, it must be conditioning and the mindset, which has got to change. Yeah. Uh, and to make a, make a point about what you just said, um, one thing that clicked with me over Christmas was, remember the old way of doing things, you know, it wasn't a given for every client, but for most clients where there was value, um, legitimate value, you'd have the SOA meeting, you'd have the SOA fee or invoice fee, whatever it is, and then you'd have the ongoing service package. This package is pretty good for you. We think you're a gold or a silver or, you know, the, everyone knows 2010, 7, 6, 5, 13, 14. It's, it's the way it was done. Now, I still think there's a lot of merit in ongoing coaching, ongoing advice, ongoing handholding. A lot of what we do is handholding, let's be honest, and clients yeah. value that. They value yes. handholding. And the convenience because, you know, he's so time poor, he just wants to outsource it. In the same way that I get my mechanics to my car because, one, I'm pretty hopeless on the tools and, two, I don't have time in my car. Totally. Or, the one thing that clicked me over Christmas was not every single client needs an ongoing service, okay? This might be uh, very uh, normal news to most advisors out there, but, again, conditioning, okay? Um, and so I made the conscious decision in my own head this year to, to one, I'm at capacity, so not take on any more new ongoing retainer clients Wow. to in my head, unless I think there is enough there for me to bite into enough value there for me to, to charge them, you know, that 1450, 1550, 1700, 1800 a year on a, on a retainer, whether it's super, a mixture of super insurance, budgeting, cash flow, coaching, investment, all in one, I will say, look, we're not taking on any new ongoing retainer clients. I think your situations with this good plan I've done for you is pretty settled let me call you in 18 months, two years and see how you're going and maybe offer you an ad hoc review. We can come in, do a reflect, review, refresh, pull out the whiteboard again and see where you are. Yeah. That's my change of mentality, whether it's right or wrong. It's, it's, it's working for me right now. Um, the pressure of having to take on all these new clients is, is, is crazy because of the mindset. Yes. So up front, I'm taking on initial clients, but I'm not taking on any new clients ongoing until I really slim down or I see where we, where we land on our feet in, in a year or two. Um, one of the things, if I was to ever open the doors again um, as a financial planner, would be uh, after all these conversations I've had over the years, um, I would actually have a, a year-long onboarding mm -hmm. and have um, sort of an SOA at the back end of that. Mm -hmm. So literally they would, they would come on and for the first couple of months find out what it is that they want out of life you know, where is their current situation and, and, and do sort of, you know, like monthly or bi-monthly either Zoom or in-person coaching sessions um, and really set, I guess, the foundation and the education for everything because it is quite a lot of information in a, in a statement right. of advice, right? So many working parts. Yeah, so many working parts. And so for some reason, like, we always started, well, I used to always start with the SOA and then do the ongoing sort of catch them up to speed after the fact that the big piece of advice are being delivered. That's just crazy to me now. So what, what should be happening is getting the person in through the door and maybe r rather than having uh, only a upfront client and only ongoing clients, maybe there's like a year to decide. So, so they come through the door and they get, you know, like a, a level of education and, and, and it's about them, but it's also about their financial planning. And then, and then at the end, whenever that end is, it's like, here's, here's the um, statement of advice. Here's the recommendations. This is why we're recommending it. This is what I know you understand why it is that we're recommending it. And then at that point, have the discussion. And over the course of that period, you're going to, I think, have a really good idea as to whether you want an ongoing relationship or not. And to be honest, for that one year, you could probably charge, I would say, substantially more than what you're already charging. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's, uh, I could be wrong if my interpretation is, is not on here, but that, that lends itself to the, the, the coaching model when you're, you're, you're breaking things off in blocks and, and you're really actually, um, is, that, is that right? Like it, it, it sounds like a bit of an ongoing coaching. Um, yeah, it, it's ongoing coaching and education to yeah. get up to, to, it's almost like you're doing um, like a pathway of upskilling to eat before you even get advice. Yeah. Roadmap to advice. Yeah, yeah. Correct. And overlay on top. Yeah. So I don't dispute that that would work. Yeah. I think a lot of alternative models coming out from all sorts of uh, existing and new firms. 
And to be honest with you, if I had my way, I think one-on-one -on -one advice is becoming very, very difficult. And if I wasn't in a position where I had debt and I had obligations and accountability, I mean, I, I may look at really unwinding an online model or an online coaching model or an online course and really building up from that. I think, is it Leah, Leah Skodal? Yeah, yeah. Shadell. Yeah, yeah, who you had on the show a few times over the years. I think what she's doing is brilliant. And I think that every, every third or fourth advisor are thinking, coaching versus advice, what's the difference and how do we actually find a bit more about it? Yeah, no, 100%. Um, a, lot of, a lot of advisors actually... I've, I've received some backlash. I always receive some backlash, you know, with, with oh. that, with regards to, <laughs> I would, with regards to the podcast, you know, uh, but our, our goal has always been to interview everyone and anyone. Um, and so when we have dipped into the areas of the coaching, especially when those coaches are unlicensed financial advisors, so they're not paying that $50,000 per year to open the doors. Um, and they're not touching statements of advice and they're not touching financial product product. I've actually received a little bit of kickback from advisors saying, Hey, don't talk about that. Don't, don't even give that any kind of platform because you know, in a, in a way that you're sort of con condoning it. And, and I, I, I think, well, my, my condoning only comes from the fact that I think advisors should be adopting those skill sets and charging if there's a demand for it, why wouldn't the people who are best placed to provide that service be the licensed advisors? But the other, the other side of the coin is, well, yeah, kind of like if you're not interested in giving advice and doing the whole thing, then does it make sense for you to build a, a small financial coaching business? I guess the only difference is I can't see a financial coaching business and I'm prepared to eat my words here. I can't see it becoming huge or successful. That's probably my only reason why I wouldn't do that. Well, here's the thing. So much of what you just said in that couple of sentences are grey areas, and I can see the frustrations from both sides. There's, ASIC can barely make a stance on, 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 on anything, let alone what is personal, general, coaching, uh, you know, what does a retainer look like? So I can see the frustrations. And, and yeah, like when you look at those models, you go, well, wouldn't it be easy if I just scrapped the $50,000 a year and did that? But then there's also, you've got to, I got to give them credit for trying something different, for exploring something completely new. We're in this financial space and it's so much is happening right now. There's, there's legs falling out, there's spontaneous combustion, there's, there's little fires going out everywhere. So it's a very, very weird world we're in. And um I just think that uh, a lot of that comes out of the frustration that we all have that, you know, there's just so much changing at once. There's so many different agendas. It's all very, very hard to sort of um, digest. So the ones that are moving into coaching, I think it's frustrating, but it's also it's exciting and interesting because at least they're trying something different. Absolutely. And um, you know, education is good. They're trying to educate. They want to get to more people. Look at ASIC and the changes. We now have, now it's going to be less and less everyday Aussies getting some kind of guidance. Yeah. You can't give that cheap scaled advice anymore unless you're doing it one to many. Yeah, hundred percent. And then it's got to be sort of general in nature. Yeah. I, I'm really, really bullish on face-to-face -face advice. Mm -hmm. um, and a part of me goes, a part of me, yeah. Like, so if I'm looking at it from a, from an advisor point of view, I'm sort of getting to the stage where it's like, okay, well, I can see where, the rules and regulations are pushing advice. It's basically to push the everyday Australian out of advice. Unintentionally. Unintentionally, unintentionally. But at the same time, that is the unavoidable outcome. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so like, I, I don't think it's a, a mark on the ethics of the advisor to adapt to that exact environment. I, I'm, um, I'm of the view that, within the next couple of years, it's going to be a case of if a client can't pay $5,000 a year, then it's probably not worth your time, effort and focus. Mm. Like to that extent, I, I'm, which, which obviously like is, is very different to your current business model. But like I, it, I just, I see it. I, I don't think there's no point being a martyr to, to ASIC. You know what I mean? It's like, Oh, you know, I got taken out because I, I I overextended and but I wanted to look after more people. It's like, well, 
you can only do so much. You, I mean, you can't break the law. And so if that's where advice is headed, then maybe we should just head there. Well, that, well there's, so much, there's so much dialogue to go off in between, but uh, if we're only charging 5000 a year and you're blocking out a, a large portion of, of demographics that need help. I mean, my, my target market is young families. Yeah. Switch your focus five years ago to 30s, 40s and families in, in, uh, in apostrophes there. Um, because they're the ones that need the help with all, all, the, all the funky working parts, you know, mismatch insurances, no insurance, multiple super funds, budgeting, coaching, goals, uh, goal prioritization, goals and conflicts. Um, yeah. Investing for the future, Disneyland, education. Not making dumb decisions. Yeah, return to work, not making, yeah, yeah, some, some uh, putting, put, yeah, soundboarding, soundboard some silly ideas, soundboard some good ideas, let's roll with a few, let's, let's talk about it. Return to work advice, childcare advice. There's a lot there. My, my, my most time-consuming upfront clients are young families by a country mile, by a country mile. Insurance alone is so in complex in navigation that, um, but, but, you know, how many young families are going to shell out $5,000 on, on an invoice? No, 100%, man. And they can, um, look, yeah, I know it's hard for certain cities and different income levels in Sydney and Melbourne and the likes, but, I mean, I, we can only use down here in the Gong. It's a lot of blue-collar workers, and I can tell you now they just can't. No, I and and I'm <laughs> I'm I'm mirroring your frustration. I can, yeah. Broadly, if we just say it's a five thousand dollar market, then well, it's it's a bit sad, but um... yeah, it's massively sad. I, I think it's insanely sad, and um, I think from a consumer's point of view, like you know, with the FASIA board having multiple consumer representatives on there, mm. I would imagine that at some point there has to be a scoping out um, of a way for, for the everyday family who can afford a couple of grand, but not five grand a year to get advice. Mm. Um, yeah, man, it's just, it's, it's an unfortunate side effect of all these changes is it's just looking like advice is purely for, let's call it the rich. Mm. Mm. It's difficult, you know? It's a puzzle that we're uh, constantly putting pieces in and taking out, I think, as we speak this minute, this moment, this month, this year, you know? Yeah. Um, one thing you can do in your business is, is try and, again, look, look, at your, look at your books, look at your efficiencies. If you can reduce your cost a little bit and try and, and do that to offset putting clients' fees up dramatically or, 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 you know, having to push clients out, then that might be a choice you have as well. Um, my, business, my business is directly unique to any other. It's just it's very simple and very, very lean. So I think, but your business is very much um, a quintessential financial planning business. I mean, there are, there are thousands of uh, advisors that have exactly your demographic. They're, they're the advisors that keep the, the Australia running like the, the middle-class Australia it relies on advisors like you and, I would say the vast majority of advisors are, are, are handling exactly your demographic. Um, and so if advice gets to a point where, because I read somewhere, you know, like that the, it's on its way to becoming a minimum of $5,000 per year. And I was like, man, that's going to just wipe out so many people. So we're, we're, we're going to go from like 14% of people getting advice to four. Mm. It would be mental. It would be mental. Yeah, uh, there's, there's so many factors, right? Which capital city are you operating out of? What, what's your lease? What's your rent like? Uh, do you have debt? Did you start your own business and have a bit, of, a bit more autonomy? Um, are you giving complex advice, simple advice, high sums, low sums? Is there insurance there with a hybrid commission which you're happy to take which offsets that? Yeah. There's still a lot of factors to play around with, which is really good. Yeah, no. But yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Take, it as it, take it as it comes. Uh, my mantra is just love your clients, treat them like your family. Um, and, and, um, and the rest tends to look after itself or it has for me anyway. Mate. And, um, and I have watched what you've been doing over like a substantial amount of years now. And from what, from where I'm sitting, I think you're doing a, like a really good job and, and the, the sort of the updates that you, you're giving me and, and your ability to sort of stay ahead of the curve, um, I think is a, is a really good sort of example of how an advisor, despite the, and I'll use the word again, maelstrom of all the stuff that we're going through. Um, someone is able to stay ahead of the game and keep sort of a, a positive approach 
a profitable approach, plan to be in business for a long time and giving advice for a long time. Um, and it, it's that sort of resilience that is probably the only thing that for anyone out there trying to take down financial advice, they're probably just not considering enough is the resilience of advisors. No, no other, no other profession could go through the changes that advice is going through and be able to operate in real time under the threat of yeah. everything from, uh, you know, tort law all the way up now to criminal law, law and everywhere in between. Like it is crazy. The threats that are out there now. And, um, mate, it's always like, honestly, like to, to hear the way that you, you approach things and you move forward and stay on the front foot is really inspiring. I appreciate that. Um, look, I think resilience of all financial planners as, as a whole group, including XY and, and external to XY has been immense. We've had to, we've had to be resilient. I feel like last year we all had grand plans and it just turned into survival mode, to be honest with you. I think Emily said this really well, was uh, a lot of the little goals and, and, and track points we all had just turned into survival. Um, but yeah, I use, my, uh, I, use, I use a lot of the pain and the frustration to try and pull my back against the wall and push myself a bit higher and just, just keep pushing on. Um, but yeah, the day in the life of a financial advisor is, is very much up and down, you know. Um, I had three income protection claims in the last 12 months. One, one's terminal and it's uh, the most rewarding thing when you hear those phone calls. We cannot thank you enough. What can we do? I didn't expect this. I didn't know it will pay. How can I help? How can I help you? Well, thank you so much while they're in hospital. Like it's, uh, there is rewards there. There is a little pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, but uh, it, it's just a, a matter of pressing on. Um, and, and, on and on that as well, <clears throat> you know, I think the mental health of our profession has taken a battering just broadly across the line whether you're in the BDM world or the insurance world or you're a, a risky or you're a, an advisor or whatever it is, practice manager, account, uh, support staff as well. So mental health is important. <clears throat> it's, it's not something to be, to be uh, thrown around lightly and, um, you know, we should use um, resources like XY, uh, like our licensees, Beyond Blue, or any organisations or, um, um, you know, uh, support lines that have been set up through your licensee. Definitely use those because... Uh, keeping it all in is, is, a, is a dangerous one, definitely. Yeah, so, yeah my, I've had a few ups and downs um, at the exact same time as the industry going up and down, <clears throat> you know, having a 14-year relationship uh, breakdown at the same time I bought the business and uh, it all happening at once. So, yeah, life can be tough. It can crush you. But, yeah, use that resilience to just push through day at a time. Absolutely. Yeah, man. And, and, and share that with your clients. Don't be afraid. I mean, don't tell them every gory detail. I don't, they don't want to hear that. <laughs> but um, but tell, them, tell them how you're feeling and tell them what's been happening because they're the ones that come to your Christmas parties, that come to your boredom events, that ask, has the kids or has the so-and-so, has the, the trip to Singapore or whatever you're doing in your life. They're the ones that are asking. So, uh, yeah, be vulnerable and just let them know that you've been hurting but you're, you're all good or the industry is going through a big change. But their portfolio is safe, as, safe and sound and their service is not changing or give them some reassurance that you're okay because, or let them talk to you so that you, you, can, you can get to that point because they're relying on you. You know, your mental health goes and then your ability to help your clients go. So look after yourself first, I think is important as well. Yeah, the, the mental health um, conversation is a very tough one. Okay. Um, and uh, it was sort of it was sort of enough to to bring uh, you know Sam Henderson out of the woodworks um, for us to have a conversation about that. Um, actually, Alex Vikovic did a really good article on Sam just on Friday about exactly that sort of you know the, the shame that um, many advisors sort of carry just being publicly dragged through it. Despite the fact that it was the Royal Commission into Financial Services, I swear it just all landed on advisors. And um, yeah, I mean, look around. Yeah, sold the you know, sold all the big banks are out of advice now, and, and we're the ones lumped with a hundred percent increases. I mean, yeah, it's it's, it's crazy. Um, I'm starting to sort of get my head around the UK, like what happened over there in terms of they went through something pretty intense. They lost half their advisors over the course of a couple of years, and then. They're only just now rebuilding from there. Australia's already down to 20,000, um, depending how you measure it, but from 25 down to 20. Um, so we're already seeing that. And, 
yeah, hopefully this year, I, I, I mean, a, a lot of the rules and regulations are, are coming into play this year, but it'd be nice to, to hear a positive news story this year. I'd, I'd like something like that. It'll be great. Um, you know, my dealer group's been through a little bit in the last 18 months, but it's already under new ownership. I can, there, is, there has been some, some really simple but effective compliance relief and just relief in a few areas. So that's always helpful for me. I mean, hopefully there's other licensees that are sort of wriggling, wriggling their way back to, to, to normality as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think if we can all stick together um, and, and we can just rough out the storm, I think in 24 months, I'd like to think our profession will be in, in a better place. Um, but of course, there's so much dialogue to go in between there. So many horror stories, so many success stories, and so many sad stories about losing experienced advisors, um, r- riskies. Uh, you know, there's just so many stories. You really don't know which one to latch onto. So what I try and do is, is tune out. And say, it, 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 what I'm doing right now, is it going to increase profits, make clients' lives easier or reduce costs? If you can focus on those three things, um, maybe you'll look at what you're doing if it's not going to help those three things or it's counterproductive, like the, the press, looking at all the press online, which I've now blocked out for over 35 days. Um, I've got a, a blocker on all those websites. They're just consuming me um, deliberately, unintentionally, intentionally, every way possible. So, yeah, if that helps. Just use each other to help. Yeah, man. Mate, thank you so much for the update. Um, it's really good just to dive into um, deep conversation with you. I, I find, you know, you're, you've always got a really good insight with a lot of this stuff because I, I feel like in a lot of ways that you represent a, Australian advisors. Like in my mind, if, 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 that, if, if I had an avatar for, you know, someone who's gone from power planning through to advisor, transitioned into the owner, like that whole story, just you, you've got such an amazing breadth of experience and you're still relatively young and you're a legend as well. So it's always great to catch up, my man. So thank you so much for coming on. If, if anyone sort of wants to reach out, say hi. I mean, you're on LinkedIn uh, and, and yeah. X, Y, yeah, of course. <laughs> Email, phone call, you can get me. I um, I've, I've drawn a lot of strength from X, Y in the last four years, and I feel like I feel like I've taken more than I've given back. So I'm always trying to give and share and help. But honestly, you know, anyone who uh, is struggling, just pick up the phone because uh, it's it's amazing what a 15 minute phone call can do with another advisor, just to get an insight or just to share their frustrations. It is hugely, um, it is hugely strong to to lift you up. So yeah, use those around you. Uh, and we'll all be fine in the end. Awesome, man. Thanks for coming. Pleasure, mate. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.